Okay. We've, we've talked about several uh, methodologies to try to uh, assess some of the questionable findings or difficult findings. And uh, when I met with uh, Paolo the first time in Ontario, uh, and he described to me what we were looking at, which was essentially a lot of stiff valves and stiff veins that didn't dilate, I came home totally confused, not knowing how I would differentiate normal from abnormal, collapse from stenosis. And I just said, I'm going to try uh, IVUS for every case to see what I could do. And I thought IVUS was pretty helpful and in three areas predominantly. Uh, one in assessment of the diameter of the vessel in a dynamic way by activating the thoracic pump. During IVUS, you can see distension and collapse. Distension and collapse is very helpful. Also in the, in the presence of compliance and, and how much distensibility there is, uh, anticipating the need for stents and having a great deal of trepidation about undersizing stents. And third, if the valve was still if stiff, how could I see the valve? And uh, we were able to f um, use the uh, IVUS to evaluate and look at the valve while it's uh, during, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in an ad hoc way that was very helpful. And then we discovered a few other abnormalities that we didn't anticipate. Um, and we've talked about this already. The, the narrowings that we see are either strictures, i.e. fixed narrowings, or compressions by some adjacent structure uh, that overcomes whatever radial force the vein actually has at low volume. We have hypoplasias. Which doc, we've seen uh, several people show very interesting hypoplasias. Of course, we could have strictures if this were an inflammatory disease, and it probably is an inflammatory disease, although not in multiple sclerosis and some of the other uh, uh, cases. I've seen it from radiation, and I've seen it iatrogenically, of course. And finally, the narrowing could be that we just have a st uh, not just a stiff valve, but a fused valve where the osteum of the valve, it becomes an osteum when it's all fused, and the contrast has to trickle through a narrowed uh, valve that doesn't really open up. So which narrowings to treat is really a challenge. Um, do we, this narrowing up here, or here, or here, um, or here and here, it's very confusing, and, and I thought I was, was quite helpful for me. Now, there are many inconstant narrowings, and that's because the jugular vein is so uh, highly compliant and it distends when it's filled. But if there's a central obstruction, then it doesn't distend because the flow is bypassing the jugular vein, or the majority of it is going into the vertebral system and other collaterals. So you have this underfilled, distended, very collapsible structure and there are narrowings that really just represent underfilling. And in those situations, my experience is that the jugular vein appears to narrow, perhaps we could say physiologically, in several distinct and reproducible areas. One is that the, the strap muscles relatively low down. Uh, the second and most constant one is in the carotid bulb region, and it may extend beyond the carotid bulb. If the, vein, if the artery kind of traverses along the jugular vein, it may collapse it even higher. And at C2, and I'm not sure why it does it there, I'm not sure what the uh, associated anatomy is that causes compression of the vein. Uh, certainly at the jugular bulb, you can, uh, jugular canal, it looks narrowed pretty much most of the time. And then we see dural sinus narrowings that may be clearly inconstant and look sometimes as if there was occlusion of the dural sinus when we know it's really not occluded. So this is IVUS and how it helped me in trying to understand some of the diseases. And you can see how the, um, the vein looks quite distensible here on the IVUS, but when it's adjacent to the carotid bulb, it narrowed down very clearly against there. There's really this is so clearly related from one step to the other 
uh, that I was confident that this was just an impression of the bulb. Uh, hypovolemic collapse, um, you know, which of these are hypovolemic? I believe this is hypovolemic. And, um, and down in this area, it looks really pretty terrible. And this is what the ibis looks like in this area. So what I did was have the patient take deep, deep, slow breaths, and at the end of, and just watch the, the, vessel, watch the vessel on ibis. And this is without moving the probe at all. And you can see how much distensibility there is in that vein. And based on that, uh, I made the decision, right or wrong, that I'm not going to treat that because it's inconstant. Uh, I'm, not, I'm left with the dilemma that is it possible that the vein just has no structure and will collapse no matter what? And I can't answer that yet. But I think that this IVIS helped me a, a great deal in evaluating this patient. Uh, the obstruction in this patient was here, and I believe that this area uh, is, fills very nicely after dilatation. Uh, here's uh, an interesting situation where there's slow flow in the vein, but the vein looks perhaps a little bit narrowed. And um, I think you could easily justify doing dilatation uh, of this area. But I did IVIS. And what IVIS showed was this interesting structure uh, adjacent to the vein. And it's elongated, and uh, it's certainly a fluid-filled structure. And if the patient valsalvas, this distends. So what could this be? Well, I, having done it a few times now, I, I know what it is, and it's what I would call a duplication, incomplete duplication of the vein. So uh, in my brilliance, I pulled a catheter out of the jugular vein to prove it, and here you can see this blind ending sac sitting posterior to the vein. And this does two things. Sometimes, if the, the external jugular vein fills rapidly into this area, it washes into here and can hide the stenosis behind this duplication, which opacifies, superimposed on the vein. In this situation, I then spent 45 minutes trying to recatheterize the jugular vein. It made it so difficult, and uh, I, I, for, for science, we did that. And uh, you can see the dilatation here, and we, we were able to get uh, good flow on that situation. Uh, this is another one that's obstructing. Again, now you've seen it once, you'll recognize it on IVIS. Uh, this is another duplicated duplication. Uh, uh, sorry, this is the duplication. And this is the jugular vein. And um, it doesn't show very well here, but you can see that I've injected the duplication on this image here on the far right. And it extended tremendously far up. So if I were unfortunate enough to have put the catheter into that first, I would have said the jugular vein is thrombosed and not filling the rest of the jugular vein, and it wasn't real at all. It's just a duplication uh, or a septum with two lumina. You know, that's a semantical issue here for me. And this patient did not do well. Um, this went on to uh, thrombose. Um, and this, the duplication is sitting right here. And it, whenever that patient would strain or anything, it would compress and collapse that jugular vein. I think it's an important uh, observation. Uh, many times when you do a contrast study, you'll see the contrast hanging up on the uh, valves like this. And, you know, IBIS is very useful here. And, and this is just a good illustration of what a fixed valve looks like. The lumen, let's see if I can get this to work. The lumen extends out here, but the valve only comes out to here. So what we're seeing is an incompletely opening valve. If, sometimes I can imagine it that it's like a flutter. It, it never does this, it just does this. And effectively, we have a stenosis. And I think it's helped me understand that the narrowings that we see sometimes are valves that are malformed and fused, leaving a sort of a hole through which the contrast media and blood goes. 
And that, I've shown that before, and that's what we're seeing is this really ridiculous situation of multiple valves that are stuck. Um, again, uh, hard to see on here. This is the probe, and I'm, I just can't see it from here. I'm looking for the azagous vein. Uh, right at the orifice of the azagous vein, there was stuck valves. And uh, you can see it again. I think this one's actually a bit better that you see that it never quite opens up compared to the, the lumen that surrounds it. And uh, it's hard to see, but this, if, this is the actual stenosis. I was, and it's retrospectively, of course. We, we saw this first, we saw the narrowing and we pulled down the, the ivus right to here, and you could just watch as your lumen gets smaller, you know, normal size, and all of a sudden it's small. Um, I don't think it's particularly helpful in here, but it is something that we can see. And um, I had one more, but I'm not gonna show it. So I just wanted to show, I think ivus has some role, but we, it's like everything else that we've learned today, we've just learned that we have a lot to learn. And I don't think any of us really have the answer yet. Um, we've learned a lot of imaging, and we don't know what its role is. We've seen multiple people doing really interesting uh, interventions, and they're all doing it differently, and they're all getting pretty good results. Um, and we just need, eventually what we'll end up doing is comparing one result to another to see which gives a better result. But for the moment, what we have to do is individualize our treatments and be consistent in how each individual does them so that we don't scatter our ideas and do something one time, something another. We really need to stay focused uh, individually so that we can then present our material as this is a technique and these are the outcomes, and then we can start to see which ones come up with uh, better results. My original uh, intention was to follow Paolo Zamboni's technique and validate what he said. Um, but it, it was, there were things that I noticed right away that I had to change, but I'm trying to hold on to a specific focused way of doing things. I added Ivis. He only used 10 millimeter balloons, and the reason they only used 10 millimeter balloons in Ferrara is because they really didn't realize that they were bigger balloons. That's what they told me. So, um, you know, I, we all gonna learn from each other, and we really need to have more of these meetings. And I'd like to have one uh, periodically, uh, anyhow. I wanna thank everybody for coming and staying for a really long day. I think it's been profitable for me. I learned a lot, thank you all. It's, it's our intention to uh, take the, uh, the video and, and get it on YouTube as soon as we can, but I'm sure I'm gonna be beaten by somebody else. <laughs> Gary told me this great story. He treated a patient and he got a text message on his uh, pager uh, telling him that his patient in the recovery room had made an improvement. <laughs> I, I didn't know that yet, so I was sitting in the Yeah, he didn't know that, yeah. So, well, thanks a lot.